want you to go to the book Revelations chapter 3 verse 20 Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Father, let this word change us today. Shift our relationship dimension with you today, Father, in every way. We love you, Lord. We need a move. Come and do what you do. Open up our hearts, our minds, our schedules, the time you've given us. It all belongs to you, Father. So receive all the glory and praise for what we share today. For this is your word for your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Somebody shout amen. amen. La, la, la. You do Glory to God Glory to God Amen We need a move Amen We've been talking about prayer Let's learn a few things. I've been teaching you about prayer. You learned some of it last week. I just want us to hear what God wants us to learn today um, in the area of prayer and be able to discern and understand. Now, whatever you do, whatever you find yourself doing, the only way and the best way to learn how to pray is to pray. Yeah, you can read the 21 different ways of prayer, 24 different dimensions of prayer, Limited prayer and limited prayer, but at the end, prayer is prayer. And, and as long as you give your heart to it and to understand it, the end of it, just need to close your eyes and pray. Make time for it. So I want to delve a little bit into helping you understand there are no experts in prayer. Prayer is prayer. There are no people that are experts in the area of prayer. Uh, they, everybody has everything you need to be able to learn how to spend time with God. We're all learning. We're all growing. We're all reaching for that place. We're all desiring God. Uh, I read a quote by Charles Spurgeon. It said, prayer does not fit us for greater works. Prayer is the greater work. If you can achieve a prayerful life, everything else in your life will bow down to what God tells you to do, how God instructs you. Prayer is powerful. Um, there's a way we talk about prayer that reinforces what I call some form of cynicism or tiredness around prayer. We end our conversations with people. We say things like, I'll keep you in my prayers. Uh, I'll remember you in prayer. My brother, I'll lift you up in prayer. Knowing very well, we won't. And so it's become a normal thing to say just to be able to finish a conversation and sound like we have a good relationship with God. Uh, don't worry, this week you're the one I'm praying for. <laughs> and we never get around to praying, but because truthfully there's a point some of us have reached sometimes where you feel... Prayer won't change it anyway. Even if I do it, I haven't seen it work in my life. I want to delve a little bit into this. What enforces this kind of cynicism? What enforces the kind of doubts we sometimes have in prayer? Even in a church, when you start the subject of prayer, uh, people switch off. It's one of those subjects that if we don't find a way around how to really believe it works and see it work, we can never be a powerful people. You cannot take any cities without prayer. You can't take nations without prayer. Um, we can't continue using prayer speak as the way to conquer. We must enter prayer. One of the most common frustration is the activity of prayer itself, praying. If you call a church for a concert, chances of filling up are very easy. 
if you call a church for exhortation and word by so and so who is a guest coming, church packs out. But if you call a church for prayer, and I believe the dimension we must move into in Kenya, for where Kenya needs to go, we must become praying churches. We must enter a dimension of prayer we've never entered before. And so we must go into the boring subject so that we can become powerful people because it's only boring because of how we position it, because of how we've gone through life. Uh, sometimes you start praying, you last for about 15 seconds. You last 15 seconds before your mind starts to wander and all of a sudden a shopping list pops up in your mind when you pray. All of a sudden you start to see things. You know, it's interesting that you can watch a Game of Thrones from episode one to episode seven. Your mind didn't go anywhere. It was just there. But then when it comes to prayer, in 30 seconds, you're just saying, did I drop my socks or were they picked up by somebody? What happened? Or anything that can distract us, begins to distract us. Um, 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 our minds go off on a tangent. We catch ourselves and by sheer force of the will, we go back to praying. It's by force. We force ourselves to go back. And, 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 and before we know it, it's happened again. So instead of praying, we start doing a thousand, we start doing a confused mix of a thousand things that we are wondering and worrying about. Then the guilt sets in. Sometimes we start to say, then maybe something's wrong with me. Maybe this prayer thing is not really for me. And, and, and before we know it, other Christians don't seem to have this trouble praying and after a few minutes you give up, you say, I'm not good at this. I might as well get some work done. Something is wrong with us. Our natural desire after creation was prayer. It came from creation. We are made in the image of God. Prayer is a priority. Our inability to pray, it comes from the fall. And so because of that distance that was created by the fall, evil has marred the image and we want to talk to God, but we can't. The friction of our desire to pray, combined with our badly damaged prayer antennas, leads to constant frustration. It's as if we've had a, it's as if we've had a stroke. We're unable to pray, and that in the spiritual stroke is what I mean. So, so, so this, is, this is sometimes what causes a lot of confusion uh, regarding prayer. We, we vaguely sense that we should begin by focusing on God, not on ourselves. So when we start to pray, you try to put everything in gear. You realize I'm not entering. Let me put worship. <laughs> so you put worship, and then you start entering in worship. And even in worship, you find yourself distracted. Uh, sometimes, actually, you may not know. What you do is you like the song. You're not really worshiping. So you, you actually think you've entered the presence, but you really like the song. The tune is very nice, very catchy. But are you truly, are you truly praying? So we put on that worship and we, we start wondering, did I worship enough? Why am I not penetrating? Did I really mean it? So we start to do things like putting together prayer lists. Sometimes praying through that list becomes boring and dull because nothing seems to happen. The list becomes long and cumbersome. We lose touch because of many, many needs we have. And so we, praying starts to feel like a crazy thing. But I want to talk to us today. The problem we have is we're living in a generation where we are used to being entertained. It's television. It's the internet. It's the video games. It's the cell phones. When you come from work, you enter another world. When you enter that other world, you come from there to another world, from that world to another world. We're used to bustling sounds around us. Something has to be happening in the background. C.S. Lewis called it the kingdom of noise. Everywhere we go, we must hear background noise. This is a generation that has refused to settle. We must have noise. So if you go to a church and there's no noise, God is not happening. There's no boom, boom. If the bass the bass drum is not deep enough. God is not entering deep enough. We need, we need noise. If, if we come from a place, we can't deal with silence. We must put earplugs in our ear, in our iPods or iPads through our phones. Something must be happening. 
to keep engaging me in entertainment, in background noise, because we are uncomfortable with silence. We become a generation that doesn't want to hear any silence. Restless energy. Our church services have to have the same. So you find yourself in a world where something needs to be happening. I need to be engaged all the time. Our church services need to be engaged. We must have singers from Nigeria, South Africa, the United States. We must have Bishop Jakes come so that the church is happening. The church that's happening the most in Kenya is the one that was able to bring Pastor Benny in. The gifts of the Christianity of Christendom keep coming to that church. That's the church. But did you know you can bring every guest and not be a friend of God? I'm scared. Pastor Liz preached this once. I'm scared to go to heaven and for him to say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. If there's anything that should scare any of us as ministers is to, is to have all this activity. <laughs> While a guy with a church of 12 people in Kibera is being welcomed in heaven with fanfare. You who had 10,000 people and the guitar was plucked right We, 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 we are comfortable with meditation. We don't want to have a moment of silence. I was telling them in the first service, I had to learn so much. God has taught me so much through my wife because I'm, I'm, I'm the kind of guy that had a party every Friday. She told you she was the one out there. But I, in the Christendom, I was the guy. There was a party in my house every time. So when we got married, I thought this thing will continue. A hundred church members in my house every weekend. Let's go, let's go. And, and I, I, I got to see something through my wife is that sometimes she just needs silence. She has four, four boys. <laughs> and sometimes after church, we are too much. And, and I'd go to her, and I'd come from a move of God in church, and I'd reach home, and I'd enter, and I'd find that the door to the room has been locked. And I'd say, why you not there? When God was moving, how dare you lock out of our room? And she's like, I just needed some silence. And some of us can't handle silence. We have had to learn it's funny how God pairs you up with the right person because I had to learn how to keep quiet and hear God. And she, she just said, I just need time, time out from all your noisy jokers. I just need some time with God. And I had to learn. I had to learn that God does speak when we are quiet. I had to learn that noise sometimes was an excuse for my inability to really take time to hear God. So, so I'll come back to my wife in a minute. I'll come back in a minute. So one of, the, one of the things I'm starting to be conscious about because God has given us an amazing ministry is that in the broader culture of our churches, we, we prize intellect. We prize competency. We prize wealth. So you reach a point where you believe it's okay. I can do life without God. You don't know you're saying it, but praying seems unnecessary because you have money. <laughs> you reach a point where, uh, since you have money, the things you need are quickly done without consuming time. So you'd rather utilize your money. You don't need God. Aye. You will be shocked how you'll behave if you had a billion shillings in your account. You will be shocked. Even you don't know yourself. You will be shocked how you'll appreciate the back bench of church and say, without knowing it, you'll be saying, look at these people. How they need God, or oh, how they need God. <laughs> Rent problems, car issues, school fees. Sometimes in the church today, we have taken the material things to give us comfort and say, I don't need to pray. I don't need to pray. I can do life without God. Money can do what prayers do. 
Our trust in ourselves and our talents makes us structurally independent of God. And as a result, exhortations to pray don't stick. So our relationship with our Heavenly Father becomes dysfunctional. We talk as if we have an intimate relationship, but we don't. Theoretically, it's close, but practically, it's different. I want you to look at a neighbor and say, we need help. We need help. They actually make this person up. Look at your neighbor and say, I need help. In the scripture we just read, something amazing happens in Revelation 3.20. Jesus equates his relationship and what he wants to do to a dinner table. It's at a dinner table. In Revelation 3.20 he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, opens the door, <laughs> I will come in to him and Dine with him. Talks of dinner, food, a meal, relationship. Here's what I'm discovering. Because I did struggle with this matter of prayer. I, I've, I've, had, I've, I've, I've been in different churches across the world. I needed to figure this thing out for myself. And I, I used to feel guilty when I hear someone praying with such amazing vocabulary. And people come and release a King James relationship with God and you're sitting there wondering guy am I praying it's intimidating it's intimidating sometimes when you hear these Nigerians pray even their tongues are sounding hey, intellectual it's intimidating because you know somebody comes and starts thou friend the friend that never leaves friend that never forsakes you friend who changes circumstances. You, cha you friend who changes lives, destinies. Yes, you friend, I'm talking to you. Hey! Jesus. You know you and I have come a long way together. Hey! You know you reach a point, you say, guy, papa. Then they, then they enter. In the ecclesiastical understanding of doxology, I know that, Father, you love us beyond our... Hey, Jesus says, listen, I've come and I'm knocking on the door. <laughs> I want to enter if you let me in so I can dine with you. It's odd to be at dinner with a friend and talk like that. I don't know when I've ever gone for dinner with somebody and spoken like that. Thy salt <laughs> and thy pepper awaiteth coming. Yonder to me. Could thou have grace to pass over salt that my food may be flavored? Hey, Jesus. He he's relational. If there's something I learned about God, he's relational. What perplexes me about this scripture that was brought to my heart this morning is if you look at verse 16, I think, he's speaking to a church. Jesus is speaking to a church. He's speaking to the Laodicean church and he's asking the church, he's asking his bride, excuse me, I'm standing at the door, which means he's outside. I'm knocking in my house. Can I come in? It's possible to be a church and Jesus is not inside. It's possible to be a house that prays but God is not in your business. It's possible to do the theatrical thing, the theoretical thing, but God is relational. And so when we don't have a relationship, we don't know how to talk. And I'm discovering, for you to understand prayer, you need to have a relationship with God that you can talk with him all the time. You need to be able to speak with him openly about your day, about your problems, because that's how we talk with friends. Am I helping somebody here? This is how we talk with friends. A praying life feels like family meal times because prayer is all about relationship. It's intimate and hints at eternity. We don't think about communication, it just happens. If you have to think about, if I have to sit with my wife and construct sentences. <laughs> Before I knew her, I had to. But after I have a relationship with her, 
The conversation just comes. Baby, I missed you. How was your day? I don't have to sit and say, Is intense ni kitunga na ngeli za cha. Anaweza ni ngonga na ngeli za mwa. You don't think that way. So why is it when it comes to God? Our thinking is so abstract about conversation. That's why you go in for five minutes, you're like, this is too hard. A man of God came and we were... <laughs> A man of God came and we were praying. My bishop was there, our pastors were there. This man reached a place. He wanted us to pray. He just released the word, kneel. Aye! You know, we were not even waiting. To, our knees just went down. <laughs> We just hit the camera. We were like, guy, Alpha. My bishop, myself, we were all on the floor. <laughs> you can pray out of instruction or you can pray out of relationship. You choose. You choose. And I want to be very calm as I minister this word to you because I want you to understand that prayer is intimate. You don't think of the communication. It's simply medium. The prayer is simply medium through which we experience and connect to God. I want you to look at the person next to you just for a minute. Just look at them. Look at them. Yeah? Don't, don't hold their hand because I hear there's cholera, but just look at them. <laughs> ah, you'll hold their hand later after your faith has grown. Just look at them. Look at a person. I want you to look at someone. And I want you to have, just have, have a quick conversation with them. If you don't know their name, ask them their name. Just ask them their name. Have a conversation. Ask them what they do in life. I, I, I'm seeing some people not being talked to. Talk to somebody. Just ask them. Mm -hmm. Communicate. Now give them a compliment. Just tell them how good they're looking this morning. They're looking lovely and blessed. Okay, stop. Now, how was your conversation? It was not hard, was it? You know, people struggle to learn how to pray because they are focusing on praying and not on God. Did you hear what I said? We focus on the prayer and not on God. The reason it was easy for you is because the person is there and you can see them. God is there. <laughs> and if you open your eyes, you will see him and talk with him. It's not hard. Making the prayer the center is like making the conversation the center of a family mealtime. God is there. You can speak with him. Conversation is the vehicle through which we experience one another. Prayer is not the center of what we are saying. Getting to know a person, God, is the center. That's what emanates, brings out the conversation. How do you talk to your father? How do we pray? Number one, we pray like a child. How do we learn to talk to our father? By asking like a child, believing like a child, living like a child. How do children ask? I happen to have the privilege by God's grace of having a few. Hey, if these children hear about a new video game, they have no shame asking. They will ask you and ask you. If they hear about the other day, this Avengers Endgame came out, the movie. If you don't have boys, you won't understand what I'm saying. I mean, the question was coming 17 times a day. Daddy, are we still going? This was for the week after. The next day, Daddy, are we going? The children are persistent. They ask for everything and anything. If they want to, if they hear there's a new ride at Sarit Center, I'll be disturbed. They ask, Daddy, have you heard? Have you heard? <laughs> when are we going? In fact, I got, I got careful. I don't tell them any news. I'm like, mm -mm, it's Jake Yapo. Then I find their mother has told them, oh, oh. And then you're asking now, how do we? So they ask repeatedly, over and over again. They wear us out. Sometimes we give it to them just to shut them up. And I want to show you, this is how little children ask, without guile. 
They just say what's on their mind. They have no awareness of what is appropriate or inappropriate. They ask. You just behave like a child. I remember I was telling some of you I was, I was at, a, at, a, at, a, at a thing where we were at some uh, guests and my son just shows up. My five-year-old son, he just shows up with all these people I was trying to pitch to. And he said, Daddy, I need to poo-poo now. <laughs> now is the time. This is the time. This is the hour. The hour cometh. I need to poo-poo now. I said, good Lord Almighty. You see, I'm their father. They don't care who else is around me. He knows. And in his head, he's like, listen, I know in my young age you don't like embarrassment. But if you don't take me now. <laughs> <laughs> the enemy you are suspecting is coming will be on me. So, so, so you need to understand something. When you ask like a child, they don't care that there's, a, there's chaos in Russia. They're like, I know Russia is burning. I know Ukraine, Kunahi. I know in Tanzania, but Father, I'm in Kenya, I'm in Nairobi. This is it. That's a childlike faith. You talk to him like a child. That's children. And when you go before the Father, stop being like a peer. Be like a child. Be like a child. Look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Ask. It will be given to you. That's what the Bible says, doesn't it? Ask. It will be given. Go to verse 9. He says, seek, knock. It will be opened like a child. Like a child. Glory be to God. Verse 9. What man is there among you? Look, he's relating relationship to father and son and to food. He's talking about food. A father and son relationship. Who among you will be asked by your son for bread and give him a stone? Verse, verse 10, quickly. <laughs> or if he asks for a fish, will be given a serpent. Go to the next verse. If you then, you, being evil, <laughs> know how to give good things to your children, how much more, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who seek him? With our brokenness, we'll sort out our children. Number two, you believe like a child. You believe like a child. Believe like a child. This is the second thing we must do in learning to pray. We must believe like a child. Children are supremely confident of their parents' love and power. Instinctively, they trust. They believe their parents want to do good for them. If you know your parent loves or protects you, it fills your world with possibility. Just say what's in your heart. Just say what's in your heart. When you talk about that kind of belief, Jesus starts to show us things like the persistent widow in Luke chapter 18. Can we go there? Verse 1. This, this woman would not take no for an answer. This is how we need to start believing, church. We need to start believing. Hi, yi, yi. 18 verse 1. Then he spoke a parable to them that men ought all to all ought to pray and not lose heart. How do they do it? Then he gives a parable. <laughs> Say there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Uh -huh. There was a widow in that city. She came to him saying, get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming, she weary me. Then the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said. <laughs> and shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them. Look at verse 8. I tell you, he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, he speaks about this. Men having to pray and not to faint always. And he comes and says, when the Son of Man comes, there is, an, there is a connection between prayer and faith. He says, when the man, Son of Man returns, shall he find faith? Will he really find faith on the earth?